Yeah, there are a number of different use cases that are really well suited for uh, artificial intelligence and specifically around machine learning, NLP type processing and financial services. Um, you know, some of the areas that we've been looking at are, are things that are, are, are common across all of the different types of clients, whether they're asset managers, whether they're on the sell side, buy side, etc. So use cases like data validation, right? One of the core things we do at Golden Source is cleanse and validate data that's coming in from multiple sources. So today, a lot of that is done through rules, you know, business specific rules that have to be, you know, individually entered for each use case you've got. And machine learning can help automate that whole process and take some of the, the manual uh, rule writing uh, part away from that. Um, also things like data mapping. We're mapping in data from many different sources from uh, all different kinds of, uh, of data vendors and internal systems as well. So a big part of what needs to be done on that is to map the incoming data and the fields and the descriptions of that into uh, golden source and to how that data, where that gets stored within the golden source data model. So now that's a very manual activity by putting and getting the computer to learn and to be able to recognize when two fields are, are the same or similar, it'll be able to either automatically do those mappings or at least provide guidance that an individual user can do to then select the appropriate field and make the final decision. Um, also things like exception management, uh, you know, you're generating exceptions based off of these validations, being able to automate the resolution of those exceptions, be able to prioritize it correctly based off of user feedback. You know, when a user wants to see and is constantly doing certain exceptions ahead of other ones, you know, a computer can recognize that. They can all of a sudden prioritize that and the next time they go in, those can show up on top and then the user will always be able to see the ones that he wants to or she wants to work on first. Um, another kind of use case that comes up all the time in data management is matching, right? You know, entity resolution between two different fields, two different files, you know, the the Classic example is names, right? You've got, uh, you know, names coming in, company names on multiple different files that might be spelled, uh, spelled differently or have different abbreviations, you know, associated with it, company versus CO versus limited and things like that, right? Being able to accurately recognize when those are actually the same entity and link those together is something that happens all over in your data management use cases, again, across all different lines of business. And, and finally, we get into kind of the natural language processing space where we're seeing kind of an explosion of demand for new types of data and to be able to bring that data in and uh, analyze that data quickly. So being able to bring that into a store, the end user being able to bring that data in, define that data, and then running certain types of NLP type of analytics on top of it, whether it's uh, sentiment analysis to say, you know, is this positive or negative? Being able to extract out information around, is this uh, news article about a specific company? And being able to link that information into information that's already exists within your database. And then finally, being able to take unstructured type data, for instance, uh, you know, a, a, a PDF file that gives you information about your, um, your bank loans or about uh, certain types of, uh, of funds that you're dealing with, infrastructure funds or private equity funds, being able to extract out pertinent information from that, format it in such a way that you can load it into your databases and have access to that through all of the tools that are available within Golden Source. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, for, for things like data validation, right, the types of rules you traditionally write are things like, uh, you know, is this field, let's say, a maturity date, right? Is this maturity date greater than the issue date of the security? Or is the first payment date greater than the issue date? Or you have other types of rules that say, you know, when I'm changing things like a coupon rate on a bond, is the tolerance, you know, between the last rate that I had on a variable rate, uh, you know, is there an acceptance tolerance between the change from the last rate and the current rate? 
Now, the problem we have today with that are all of those have to be recognized by people, and there's a lot of them that exist within Golden Source that we've put out there, but there's a lot of them that you don't know until it actually happens. Uh, a lot of times out there in the real world, a lot of the rules that end up in people's uh, systems come from the fact that they had a they had an issue where a bad piece of data came in, their current rule sets didn't pick it up, it flowed through, resulted in problems downstream. They go back now and enter that rule in there, and, and so it's a reactive kind of a process in a lot of things. When you get into the AI side of the world, you can create algorithms that'll recognize anomalies in the data without having to code specific rules um, for those particular uh, functions. And, th and that way you're more proactive. You can recognize the anomalies without having to have a human being write those rules based on some kind of a, a situation that arose on, on bad data coming in. Um, you know, the other one, again, on, the, on probably the data empowerment, um, you know, we see a lot of types of alternative data, especially in the uh, kind of in the asset management space, um, you know, when you're looking at research type scenarios, there's a lot of alternative data that's coming in out there. You know, the, the capability of extracting data from, you know, satellite images and, you know, just about, you name it, there's a data source out there that's providing this types of alternative data. The, the issue, though, is because you've got volumes of this and it's coming in and users want to have access to it quickly because it is very time sensitive information, you need a way to load that in get some basic validations around it and be able to access that quickly and be able to run analytics against it. So that way having a kind of a user empowerment kind of an environment where you can bring that data in coupled with you know, AI and ML to interpret that typically um, you know, semi-structured or unstructured data and being able to access that quickly is what's driving value and, and driving uh, you know a lot of the interest on the uh, on the asset management side of the world. You know, obviously, one is data quality, right? Is that you need to be able to rely on the data that's within your system. Is a lot of important decisions and financial with financial ramifications are based off of that data. So improving, having you know, better confidence in your data, um, especially regulatory data that needs to be reported out to you know, the government agencies and things like that, there are penalties associated with you know, incorrect data. So data quality is a big driver. How can I get better quality from my data? But then associated with that is the cost aspect. So I want better data, higher quality, but at a lower cost, right? The, uh, especially on the cell side, uh, I mean, you, you just read the, the papers and every day you hear a story about, a, you know, one of the big banks out there that's, uh, you know, cutting back on their, on their staff, that looking to drive down costs, uh, to invest on their, uh, on their IT infrastructure to be able to lower costs. So cost is a big driver, whether you're talking buy side or sell side. And being able to implement some of these types of algorithms can lower your overall cost. Automating the mapping process, as I talked about before, is a big cost savings. Uh, being able to, uh, to do automated exception management, having the computer help you resolve these exception management is a cost driver. So there is a cost element to this as well. And then I guess the, the third driver that we see is Really, the, the competitiveness and the, I guess, the and more on the asset management side, the need for more data to drive better investments, to provide better investment decisions that you have out there, right? I mean, you know, being able to have access to information that can give you an edge on, you know, your research, which will help you make better decisions, which leads to higher returns. Um, so, you know, and asset managers are always competing on their returns when they're trying to go out and get business from the asset owners that they have out there, you know, a big part of that is what is the returns that I can drive off of that. So being able to have access to more information to give you that edge to be able to, um, you know, drive better investment decisions to make more money to, to you know, obviously get more customers from you on the asset management side. So, so again, it's one of these things where if everybody else is doing it and you're not doing it, then you're behind the times. But if you can stay ahead of that curve, 
um, then, it, then it's even better for you. We do the scrubbing for you. So there's really no manual intervention involved in that, but obviously what that triggers is exceptions, right? So now we have exceptions. So some of that can be automated, but in a lot of circumstances that still will require human intervention. Um, another good example of that is the matching process. You know, matching algorithms can take you so far, but there comes a point in the process where you want a human being to make a decision, right? So I'm matching two names um, from two different files that I got in, right? You can figure out the probability of those being a match. So let's say, you know, if I've got a probability of it being a match, if it's less than 50%, you know what? it's not a match, just go ahead and create a new one. If it's greater than 80%, then, hey, you know, this is a match, go ahead and automatically merge those two. But if it's between 50 and 80, then I want a human being to actually sit down and look at that and make the final decision. So we're not good enough now where we were going to say in all circumstances, are we going to get a very high score or a very low score? You're still going to get scores in the middle that requires uh, human intervention and, and somebody to look at that. And then obviously, you know, in the kind of data empowerment and the analysis, you know, the whole purpose of this is to assist, to assist in the analysis process. So it is not so much replacing the analyst in this process, it's giving them the tools that they need to get more value out of the data that they're loading or to be able to properly analyze different types of data that they couldn't analyze before. So in that circumstance, you're not replacing, they're not making decisions to aid it, but they're actually using those tools to come up with better investment decisions.